Hi, everyone. Welcome back to our Tuesday seminars on the cerebellum. Um, this, uh, today, we're going to hear from Laurie Ronderig, who is the research director at the Sorbonne in Paris. Uh, she received her PhD from the Marie Curie University studying cerebellar contributions to motor and spatial learning, a work that she's continued throughout her career. Um, she then uh, did molecular genetics with Susumu Tonegawa at MIT and spatial navigation with Howard Eichenbaum at Boston University. This is a really interesting combination of um, areas of science where it led her to invent the star maze navigation test, which is used for diagnosis of memory disorders and age-related dysfunction and many um, spatial memory tasks in animals and humans. Her work has focused on the role of memory in spatial navigation. Um, I'll give you a brief description of it. You know, as, as you know, hippocampus relies on place cells to represent spatial map of our environment. But Lori, among her many discoveries, has been that the stability of those place cells in the hippocampus depends on the Purkinje cells of the cerebellum. Lori, thank you so much for being with us. Well, thank you, Reza. Uh, as I've told you before, I really want you, uh, to thank you for uh, this great seminar series that bring together the cerebellum community. Thank you for that. And uh, thank you for the invitation. So um, today I, I will um, talk and discuss with you about the cerebellum and spatial cognition and try to see uh, what type of uh, convincing evidences we have to explain how the cerebellum can help us to orient ourselves uh, in space. So let's um, first begin uh, okay, with a definition of spatial navigation. So of course, as you all know, spatial navigation is a fundamental skill that allow us to find our way through the environment. And when navigating two main processes are particularly important. The first one is really to uh, be able to recognize a particular environment, what we call map-based navigation or even allocentric navigation. We can even call it place memory <laughs> navigation, <laughs> different names, but same process. And another very important one that we sometimes forgot is this, uh, what we call uh, self-reference navigation also sequential egocentric navigation, that is really the ability to know where we, are, where we are along the route when we actually move in this environment in find a particular goal. And what is Im important is that, of course, these different type, uh, these two type of processes rely on different type of information the uh, map-based navigation one relying more on external information, such as visual, auditory, olfactory. Um, most of the time, of course, in our experiment, we use the, the vision, the visual uh, part where self-motion information are uh, even more important for the uh, egocentric or self-reference navigation, um, including proprioceptive optic flow as well as vestibular information. So what we uh, we did uh, with a, a former uh, PhD student, uh, Benedict Babayan, is we were interested um, in, in, in the characterization of the brain network associated with the acquisition of a sequential behavior um, without any sense, um, visual information uh, in the environment. So we compared, we used actually so two types of behavior, the, the blue one, is the exploration of a new environment. You can see that the blue um, line are actually, actually the track of one particular mice at different <coughs> trials. And the red here is when the animal um, has acquired uh, this sequence behavior, here turning left at the first intersection and then right at the second one. We used FOSS uh, imaging following these two uh, type of behavior. And what, what we uh, were surprised to find is that um, the exploration and the sequence behavior rely on the same activity, on, on the activity of the same uh, type of structure. So we counted actually 34 structure and the same structure were activated. However, 
uh, where the exploration relied on uh, functional connectivity between a cortical area, striatum and dopaminergic nuclei, the acquisition of the sequence behavior was actually um, associated with a total reorganization of the functional connectivity between the different structures with a more global network involving a strong uh, functional connectivity between the hippocampus, the CA1 in particular, and the cerebellum and different parts of the cerebellum. Uh, here, uh, this um, lobule 6 cruise 1 uh, hemisphere of the lobule 6 and um, um, Therm is part of the lobule six, lobule four, five, and also uh, lobule uh, nine and ten, that which are more um, vestibular cerebellum. So um, we also um, perform that in humans using the same type of task. So it's actually um, a star maze, but a reduced part of the star maze. And actually, we were also um, very um, interesting by the fact that in humans using virtual reality, we um, indeed find the same type of network and the same uh, functional connectivity, which play a very important role between the hippocampus and this time the cross one in particular, uh, that sustain the acquisition and the realization of the sequence-based behavior. Uh, the only difference we found between human and mice actually uh, was a laterality that we found uh, in human, because it was a left hippocampus associated with the right cerebellum cruise one that sustained the sequence behavior, where there, there was no, so we checked for it, but there was no lateralization in the mice. So um, following this, um, we really wanted to understand uh, what could be the contribution of the cerebellum uh, in this type of um, navigation behavior. And our hypothesis uh, was, and is still his, that may, it may contribute to the estimation of self-motion. So in this um, picture from uh, Oman and, and uh, colleagues, um, you can see that actually the cerebellum is receiving multiple sensory information um, and is known to combine this uh, different uh, self-motion information from these multiple sources, uh, visual, more optic flow, vestibular, efference copy, but also proprioceptive and somatosensory information, and is actually connected. Uh, we will talk uh, later about the, this connection between the cerebellum and the hippocampus and about the potential number of relay between cerebellum and hippocampus. And to, um, to go even more in detail in the hypothesis we, we had in mind, um, our idea um, is really that maybe the cerebellum is actually uh, performing a computation that can uh, weight actually uh, the different sensory information that the cerebellum is receiving in order to um, create a signal that uh, will be used in the navigation network and can, that uh, could uh, actually calibrate uh, this um, signal and the, the activity uh, that we can record in the hippocampus or uh, in different regions uh, involved in the navigation processes. So let's enter more in detail. So the first thing we, uh, we, we did actually is to take um, advantage of two types of uh, transgenic mice. Um, these two mice was uh, L7PKCY mice and L7PP2B mice which have actually a um, deficit of plasticity at the um, parallel fiber Purkinje cell um, synaptic level, either um, with a deficit in the initiation of the long-term depression or in the, um, in the, in the fact to create LTP and that also potentiation inside um, the cells. So using uh, the one of the mice, so in this case, it's a L7 uh, PKC mice, we developed a navigation task where the animal uh, collect rewards. So in that, in that case, two rewards had to be collected, one after the other to complete, to complete a, tri a trial. So you have, sorry, you have um, one reward that is here 
uh, in red. So this is actually uh, the goal we want that the mice will receive each time the animal uh, enters this zone. You have another, um, another reward, which is called the foraging reward in green, that will be delivered upon visiting three different for foraging zones. Uh, whatever, uh, no need to, to do it in a particular way. So the importance, the, the, the animal needs to, for example, enter a blue one, a yellow one, and a purple one. And once it has visited this three zone, it gets uh, this foraging reward. The idea is really um, to force the animal to explore the arena. And once it gets a reward, to come back as directly as possible to this goal reward. So I can show you here the behavior of the mouse that has learned. So blue, purple, needs to go to a yellow, get a reward, and should come back yeah, directly to the red. Again, yellow, blue, up. And this time, the mouse learned and indeed, what you have seen here, so a sort of sequence behavior, it's exactly what happened. So what we did uh, in order to, uh, to analyze the behavior, so we used a clustering approach to identify stereotype behavior or stereotype trajectory that each, each animal was inclined to do more frequently. So we actually measure for each training day the fraction of trials that match one of those stereotype sequences. So here you have an example of three types of stereotype sequences that a control mouse is another one. And if we plot actually the percentage uh, or, um, of uh, sequence used during the entire tri trial, you can see that um, interestingly, the control increase the percentage of sequence trials that they use uh, during the learning of this task. By a strong contrast, if we uh, look at the uh, L7 PKCY mice, we can see that um, these mice never really learn any sequence during uh, the seven days of training. So following that, so, so to investigate uh, further, uh, we used um, a GLM model in which we include position, direction, and speed as possible covariate of the model in order to uh, look at which of these uh, three types of scores can actually uh, explain the behavior we observed uh, in these mice. And what we observed is the following. So you can see that uh, here's a control. You can see clearly that uh, in light as well as in dark, actually, there is no difference uh, in the controlling of, uh, in the control of the behavior of the mice by position, direction, or speed. So three of them are perfectly uh, the same. What we observe in the L7 PKC mice is that the selectivity of play cell to both, so position here, and direction of the movement uh, uh, here on the, on the bottom, um, actually decrease more in L7 PKCY compared to the control mice. So it's clear on this example here. So light is a uh, gray light and the dashed uh, line is in the dark. And you can see here on this uh, analysis, statistical analysis that indeed, uh, directional, the direction and position uh, actually are, uh, dec are decreasing uh, in the dark compared to the control. And you can see here that is uh, clearly um, significant. So interestingly, this uh, study, I uh, forgot to say that it has been done, sorry, by, you saw the picture, I think, somewhere. <laughs> Uh, well, by Lu Zhang for the experiment and Julien Fournier for the analysis, uh, really clearly shows that this uh, cellular signal impact both position, but even more direction coding in the hippocampus and may eventually uh, explain 
that uh, who may contribute to the spatial uh, optimization of the animal trajectory when they have to learn a sequence. So um, we actually um, compare, because this is a more recent study, this study what, with what we have uh, published before. And indeed, um, we already showed that in these mice that we use for this sequence behavior, we actually already observed that uh, in uh, the dark, so play cells are perfectly normal in, in, the, in, the, in the light when animals are exploring an arena for the first time, or even when the um, arena is familiar. You can see here an example of the play cell. Of course, we have, we have quantified that on several play cells. Here is only one example. Um, and this is really to make too long, so it's very short. Uh, in the light, you can see here that actually uh, the uh, activity of this different play cell of the ensemble of play cells were totally um, disturbed uh, in the dark. We also studied these other mice, the LCN7PP2B uh, mice. And what we observed is a, 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 bit, a story a, a bit different because um, in that case, you can see that the play cells were actually perfectly stable in the dark, but was, uh, in contrary, totally unstable when mice have to re-explore an, an arena that is actually familiar to the mice. So it looked to us that um, it's not only uh, the deficit, a deficit in the computation of the cell realms that provoke a deficit in the activity of the hippocampus, but that's a different type of computation, different type of plasticity in the cerebellum may actually lead um, to different type of deficit in the activity of the hippocampus. In both cases, we have um, instability of the coding of the play cell, but clearly the two type of computation may actually weight the sensory information differently and lead to a different type of deficit uh, in, uh, in the coding in the hippocampus. So following uh, this story and the one I just uh, explained before, what we are now trying to understand is really um, first uh, the pathway uh, by which the cerebellum can actually influence the hippocampus in order to go more in detail in the type of computation that the cerebellum um, can, um, or the type of, uh, uh, yeah, computation the cerebellum may actually really uh, compute in order to influence this uh, hippocampus. So we have uh, now different hypotheses and also different pathway by which the cerebellum can actually influence the hippocampus, which you'll see can be um, either indirect or even more, more direct. So let's talk first about uh, this uh, HD, a cell navigation circuit. So uh, what is known uh, in the literature is that the cerebellum is actually uh, projecting to the vestibular nucleus, of course, a nucleus in prepositus, and um, through even more uh, intermediate, is also projecting to the head direction system, and in particular, the ADN, anterodorsal thalamin nucleus, and in, uh, to the retrosplenial cortex here. So what we uh, decided to do um, with uh, Mehdi Falanezat, so a postdoc in the team that uh, I have now recruited in the lab, is to uh, explore if uh, uh, a deficit or uh, um, a deficit uh, in plasticity, so using the same mice that we used before uh, to explore the play cell activity, could actually uh, generate deficit either in the HD signal, signal generation, in the anchoring to external cues, in maintaining uh, the coding uh, by internal cues, so self-motion cues. And we also explore uh, something a bit new, which is the coordination of multiple HD network. So to answer all these questions, so here is the, the way uh, actually we perform the analysis. So it's again, like in the play cell, um, uh, experiments, a circular arena with an object placed uh, in it. So 
and mice explore it either in the light or in the dark without the presence of the object. So you can see here the type of my, um, row map we get. So uh, in gray, the movement trajectory, the known I'll spike, single cell here, are here in red. And uh, I will show you different type of uh, representation. So here, these are the firing rates that you can hear, you can have here. So here, for example, it's a head direction cell that will code or, or fire or be active essentially um, between zero and 90 degree of direction with a peak around 45 degree. And here is a polar plot when you can see the way we represent it HD cell here. So um, again, this is the experiment we, we, we did. So either we tested anchoring to the environmental cues. For these, we might have asked to explore an arena, a novel uh, environment. So again, the circular arena in the light, presence of an object. Then the mouse um, is uh, taken out of this circular arena. The mice is again put in the same arena with no change. So exploration of the family arena. And then we turn actually the object and we looked at how um, the activity of the cell will um, answer. And in a normal animal, so what you see here is that you can see here that this cell stays stable, of course, uh, in, the, in the two uh, first experiments. And when we turn the cue, um, it actually, um, um, the activity of the HD cell is encore on this Q and is, is turned the same way, uh, 90 degree, like uh, the, the, the object. In the dark, again, uh, we do the same. In the normal um, animals, uh, the HD direction uh, is uh, remains stable. And then, uh, as I said before, we also looked at the, uh, um, the activities, the, the the current, um, the activity between different pairs of cells and the temporal coordination between a different uh, cell recorded simultaneously. And we did that either looking at two cells uh, recorded in the same region of the brain or two cells, two cells recorded in one region and uh, in the other region. So one in the ADN, in the thalamus, anterior dorsal, and the other one in the retrosplenia. And here is, for example, the type of representation we can make. So here, for example, cell one and cell two in purple and blue um, are tempor temporally, uh, have, have an activity that is temporally coordinated uh, during um, the recording, whereas the cell three is actually here firing um, at a different uh, time compared uh, to the two others. And then we can do this kind of correlation showing that indeed in the light or in the dark, these two cells, pair one and two, remain temporarily coordinated, even if we switch the light off, even if the, the mouse has to rely on self-motion information. Whereas here in pair one and three, you can see that they are not uh, temporarily coordinated. And here is, for example, all the cells that are cell pair that has been recorded in the light and in the dark. You can see here, for example, the cells that fire together, and here cells that tend to not fire to, together, temporarily together. Okay, so again, we use the two types of mice I presented you before, the L7PKY and L7PP2B. And um, so um, Medi designed. Um, 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 a technique, uh, it's actually um, 32 channel microdrive that are all made in order to record uh, simultaneously in the ADN, ADN and in the retrosplanar. So here are the results. Uh, so first of the L7 PKCY mice, and the first thing we found that is a non-stable uh, HD cell activity when mice have to rely on self-motion information. So you can see here that the spike are here uh, in black. And you can see, uh, for example, in the control that this uh, actually activity of this particular head uh, direction cell is actually constant. You can see here on the plot 
which is the sum of, of all these spikes here. Um, this cell is, for example, uh, remain perfectly stable in the dark. It's clear here. What we found in the L7 PKCY is actually that in the light, there is also a stability of the activity of this particular cell. This is, of course, an example, but we found it, I'll show you just in one minute, that we found it, of course, uh, at the level of the population. But in the dark, again, the, as, as we found it uh, in the play cell, we found that in this mice, the, in the dark, the stability of uh, the head direction cell were totally um, disturbed and did not exist anymore. So we also um, uh, showed an, an instability of this activity in the dark. Uh, so here is actually um, the population comparison. You can see uh, here uh, that in the dark, indeed, uh, we have a decrease of the stability of the directionality uh, in the L7 PKCY mice only in the dark. Um, this is clearly here uh, showing that uh, the group of these uh, cerebellum mutant mice actually perform out of the range of uh, here, the, the population. Same thing in the ADN and the retrosplenial. You can see that we found actually the same result in the two structure. We looked uh, then uh, to this temporal coordination I described you in detail before, and maybe I show you uh, this example that I think is even more obvious to understand. So we um, we looked again on these two cells. So your cell one and cell two are two cells recorded together in the ADN, so in the thalamus, and you can see that in that case, this blue and, uh, and uh, pink uh, cells uh, are not fired together. This is really clear also on this uh, correlation analysis. And it, remain, it remains the case in the light and in the dark, and it's in the same area. However, when we looked at, at um, two, uh, two cells that are recorded simultaneously, but one in the AGN and the other in the retrospinal, what we found is that cells that tend to fire temporarily together uh, in the light, in the dark, they totally lose this temporal coordination. And what we looked at the population level again, we found that indeed this is the case in L7 PKCY for all the pairs that we've recorded together, only if pairs are recorded in the two structure, IDN and retrospective. So this is actually here. Uh, the correlation showing that in L7 PKCY, you can see clearly here that uh, the correlation that exists in the in the light in L7 PKCY between this cell is is lost uh, in the dark when mice have to rely on the self motion information. So clearly uh, suggest, suggesting that um, a potential role of uh, this computation, of the cellular computation in uh, the ability to coordinate a different um, um, network, the one in the retrospinal and the one in the ADN, in order to give a very um, a unique sense of direction, which is uh, very important. We can maybe discuss later this point. So we, we tried the L7PP to be mice to see uh, what we could find. And interestingly, we found an impaired anchoring to the external cube without affecting this temporal coordination between ADN and retrosplenial. So again, uh, so you see this is the same type of sample I showed you before. So here we found the instability when mice have to explore the familiar environment in the light. Again, we didn't find any deficit in the dark. So again, it's the same mice, and we um, we found the same type of results as the one we found with play cells. So when it's uh, L7 PKCY mice, so PKCY dependent mechanisms, it's more um, a deficit in the ability to maintain stability in the dark, uh, with here uh, a temporal coordination that is affected in, uh, in these uh, L7 PKCY mice, whereas in the L7 PP2B, it's again, like in play cell, a deficit in the anchoring of the um, 
uh, visual cues that is located uh, in the arena. But no temporal, so no deficit uh, in, in the dark. So here is a, the population level showing that there is a deficit between control and L7PP2B mice when uh, they have to maintain it stable uh, in, uh, in, uh, in a familiar environment, but no difference in terms of uh, temporal coordination. So um, just to uh, summarize this part, so what uh, we can conclude for this uh, experiment is that definitively the HT signal generation is not affected in this cerebellar mutant mice. Because when, in, in, the, in the light, when mice explore the arena for the first time, the signal is really comparable to the one we observe in control. So it seems that uh, if the cerebellar cortex is involved, it, it looks like it's more involved the ability to maintain, once it has been formed, the stability of the yeah. HD signal. Yeah. Hi. If you want, yeah, you have a question? Oh, I can come back. No? Um, Sorry. Yeah? Sorry. Um, maybe in like 15 minutes. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, I'm, I'm hearing somebody. So maybe it's just because you didn't close your microphone. Um, so just to continue. Uh, Again, but it seems again that the anchoring to external queue is more a PP to be dependent uh, activity, whereas uh, maintaining uh, this stability of the um, of the signal here the HD signal, but it was the same for the uh, play cell signal, is more a PKC dependent um, uh, activity. And again, what I was saying um, just before is that what we found here is that in addition to what we have uh, showed before with a play cell. Here we can also show that this mechanism um, may be very important to coordinate multiple attractor network in different region um, in which we, uh, the brain actually um, has some uh, uh, HD uh, cells or directional representation, uh, therefore contributing to a uni unitary representation of direction. Okay, uh, so um, what is interesting is that um, because we found actually the same type of deficit in the hippocampus and the retrosplenial cortex or the anterodorsal uh, thalamic nucleus, it looks like indeed the, it it's actually favor the hypothesis that the uh, that's certainly the same signal that the cerebellum is sending to these pathways that may influence both system, uh, the HD system on the one hand and the uh, hippocampal system on the other hand. Um, to continue on these um, anatomical pathways, uh, what we did with uh, Tom Watson, a uh, former postdoc in the lab, and uh, Arturo um, Torres Eres, a former PhD student, um, is to um, try to see what type of uh, structure, intermediate structure, can ac could actually um, explain um, the again the influence of the cerebellum on the hippocampus. Because the, the one that I just show you is definitely interesting. And it, it's clear that there is an influence of the same signal along this pathway, but it's obvious that it's a very long pathway. So <laughs> we were happy, but frustrated at some point because we, we thought, okay, maybe there is a more direct pathway uh, between uh, the cerebellum and the hippocampus. So we uh, injected rabies virus in the hippocampus and we looked um, at uh, uh, after several time of, um, of um, waiting, 58 hours, 66 hours, hour, even 30 hours here, at the structure that was actually labeled and could actually constitute some intermediate. And interestingly, what we found is this uh, medial um, septum uh, diagonal band of Broca that seems to be uh, labeled uh, by uh, also the supramamillary that was clearly um, labeled uh, in this study. So um, the other thing that uh, this study 
brought uh, as an evidence also is that there is no direct projection between the cerebellum and the hippocampus. We never found actually um, labeling in the cerebellum um, after uh, 30 hours. So showing that there is at least one intermediate between uh, the cerebellum and the hippocampus. So this is actually uh, what I show you now is a non-published non um, uh, work that we are really working on uh, right now, is this idea that actually uh, the cerebellum, and more particularly the fastigial nucleus, or through the fastigial nucleus and the caudal part of the fastigial nucleus, which is the one actually that we labeled in this study, could be uh, the pathway to the hippocampus through one intermediate. And we, when we began that, so with um, um, Jensen Azenelaj, the PhD student uh, in my lab, uh, we had two uh, potential structures uh, that we were interested in, the supramamillary nucleus on the one hand and the nucleus insertus, because both are known to project directly to the hippocampus. Um, supramamillary as well as nucleus insertus, and both were actually, especially this one, uh, was uh, labeled in our uh, rabies virus uh, experiment. So what, so here is uh, Jessie Jensano. Uh, what she uh, she is now uh, doing, so she actually um, used a double injection of a virus in the cerebellum on the one hand, more in the deep cerebral amygdala and in the hippocampus to see if we could find a structure, an intermediate structure that will be co-labeled by this. So here is an experiment. So it's a double injection of a non um AV uh, here in the fastigial nucleus and a retrograde uh, using uh, red, uh, red beads uh, in the dorsal hippocampus here. Yeah. So here is a site of injection. So you can see here that there is a viral expression only in the fastigial cerebellar nucleus here, in the caudal and rostral part, uh, and retrobits here on the hippocampus. You see that in the interpose and dante that is here, there is no, um, no virus here. So doing this, uh, so she actually found um, uh, co-labeling co um, in one particular structure, which is the nucleus insertus. So, um, so you can see here, uh, so this is here the nucleus insertus, and you can see here that there is indeed um, yellow um, labeling in this uh, fastigial neuron, red beads, that comes from the hippocampus projecting uh, no, uh, nucleus inserted neuron. And when we merge, we can, you can see here uh, that there is indeed in the uh, um, neuron of this nucleus insertus co-labeling uh, coming from the hippocampus and receiving, enfin, receiving, sorry, from the fastigial nucleus and sending proje projection to the hippocampus, which is important. So she found that on several uh, mice, um, you can see this, this is here, uh, at least uh, four mice, when she found again this co-labeling um, of these two structures. So this is what we are now interested in, is really to go further with uh, this particular intermediate. That is actually also something that has been uh, uh, described as projection from the fast nucleus. Um, to the, to the nucleus insertus by a uh, work of Sacha Dulac that uh, I I'm sure you all know, of course. Um, interestingly, we looked at the other structures of the supramamillary um, is less interesting to, for us right now, even if we found um, some very small co-labeling. So it's, a, it's still a possible intermediate, but clearly um, the quantity in terms of quantity at least, in terms of uh, what we found is much less than what we found in the nucleus insertus. And we, we looked at the medial septum, that was our target uh, on the first instance. We looked uh, <laughs> several times, but we never found actually uh, co-labeling. So clearly it's not going uh, directly uh, to the medial septum, but more through the nucleus insertus. 
Uh, we also looked uh, at other type of injection uh, when actually viral, viral expression was uh, in the interposed dentate as well as fastigial, but not uh, the caudal part, uh, the one we all described, <laughs> uh, but in the rostral part. In, in that case, uh, we found nothing in the nucleus in situ. So it's it, even more interesting because it's, it looks it looked like it's uh, definitively nucleus insertus is an intermediate between fastigial nucleus and hippocampus, but it's not, it's a very um, um, precise uh, pathway because, because it's only the caudal part of the fastigial nucleus that is actually connected. Uh, I think I stop here because so we have time for discussion and uh, yeah, comment on the hypothesis and everything. Uh, just to thank, of course, all my collaborators. Uh, this is my team right now, people uh, in the team. So Mehdi Falanezad here, who did all the work on the HD cell. Uh, so Julien Fournier uh, with um, Luzong who actually analyze all the data on the sequence behavior. Um, and um, Jesse, of course, uh, Jensen Zenelage here, who is now working on this nucleus insertus project. Uh, our partnership, um, partners, and also the funders here. Yeah, I thank you uh, for your attention and uh, yeah, maybe better to answer your question right now. <laughs> Lori, thank you so much. That was just wonderful. Um, let me start the questions and ask you, uh, you've also worked with uh, people that have had, um, uh, I wonder if you can tell us a little bit about damage to the cerebellum and whether it causes uh, uh, problems in spatial navigation, particularly when visual cues are uh, removes. So I'm not directly working on uh, with a cerebellum patient, but in the literature, what you can find uh, is actually a timing problem. Uh, so they have a deficit to evaluate uh, actually um, the the process, um, the the proper process uh, in the time in time. So somehow in this sequence behavior, it's also um, uh, Sequence behavior is not only spatial, it's also organ organizing temporarily the event. Meaning that, for example, you need to remember that you have turned left on the right and left uh, on the second turn, for example, and not the contrary, otherwise you will not arrive. Uh, but yeah, definitively it's something we could um, uh, go further with some patient, but what would be interesting is because, Cerebellar patient, as you all know, of course, um, have also a lot of motor problem. So in order to disentangle uh, <laughs> this motor with a cognitive process, um, that's not so easy. So we could investigate, uh, yeah, maybe what we did with the fMRI study uh, that I didn't show uh, you here, but it's actually published if, if you are interested, is that we found that the network of the sequence behavior and the place behavior are actually um, two different networks. It involves, of course, hippocampus, cerebellum, the cruise one. And if you look at the motor uh, network, it involves a different part of the cerebellum, which are more um, um, uh, anterior part of the cerebellum that is involved with the motor cortex. Well, during navigation, it's prefrontal, parietal cortex, cruise one of the cerebellum hippocampus. So we could disentangle that using fMRI with behavior, maybe, in patient. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. Um, questions for Lori? Maybe I stop to share this so we see each other more. <laughs> yeah. Sasha or Amin, I can see. Yeah. Sure. Hi, Lori. Hey, hi, Sasha. <laughs> <laughs> Great to see you. Uh, yeah. Beautiful talk. Uh, so, uh, so many questions. I think we need. Are you going to come to the cerebellum meeting? That's the first yeah. question. Yeah, Great, we, yeah. Good. I'll, so we'll, I will for sure. We are all waiting. Okay, for so I'll, I'll try to restrict my questions to ones that are interesting to the audience. First, I need you to um, to henceforth um, claim that work as Hirofumi Fujita's work. It was really his work, the vestigial to. Uh, 
yeah. the vestigial yeah. output. So, yeah. Yeah. right. Uh, and he, you know, he has a faculty position now and is do, doing great. Okay. Yeah, We're sure. All, um, it's a great study. Yeah. So, um, a minor question and a major question. The minor question is in the human imaging studies, did you also look at paraflocculus or is that just too complicated? Mm, we looked at, um, was that to paraflocculus? I think we saw some um, like lobule nine or lobule 10 activity, this kind of thing. And it was not activated during uh, what I would call the spatial um, spatial strategy. It was actually more activated when we looked at this um, motor uh, network, actually. I see, okay. Um, and the, the bigger question is, um, are you gonna record from like the dentate or fastigial to see what's really different in the firing of the yeah, neurons yeah. after LTP and LTD? Because do you imagine that there's LTD prone and LTP prone neurons that are differentially contributing to two effects? That sort of thing. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good point. Uh, I think, well, this is something we have thought about, but my lab, uh, is, is not designed right now to record in the cerebellum. So I would be very interesting to do that, but in collaboration with somebody who, who will be happy to do that with us. So yeah, I'd be happy to do it, but yeah, collaboration. Great, sure. maybe but Reza right. can help you you're with right. Marmoset. <laughs> yeah, but you're right, yeah, indeed. Because, uh, because to, to push uh, better the hypothesis we have, we definitely need to know what happened here. If we want to explain what type of signal is, is getting out of the cell and could eventually, and how it can be modified to influence the navigation network, you're right. At some point, we need <laughs> we, we need the data. So, yeah. Happy so beautiful groundwork. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, ciao. <laughs> yeah. <See> you. <laughs> I mean, you have your hand up. Uh, I mean, you have your hand up. Uh, would you like to ask a question? Looks like it's gone. David, David Linden, go ahead. Hey, hi. That was terrific. What fun. Thank you so much. Um, mm -hmm. so, so I noticed that in the beginning in your model figures, when you were referring to the effects of the PP2B and the PKC inhibitor mouse, you were focused on LTP and LTD. Yeah. And at the end, in your last model figure, you were sort of more generic. You said PKC-dependent processes yes. and PPTB-dependent processes. Yes. And I guess I'm wondering how you're thinking about that. And, and the reason I bring this up is something that I'm sure you're aware of. Yeah. And that is when you inhibit PKC in a Purkinje cell, of course, you're not just inhibiting parallel fiber. Okay. That's LTD, right. you're, you're, you're inhibiting the phosphorylation of several yeah. hundred substrates of PKC. Absolutely. And That's similarly, right. the same concern happens with, with, uh, with, with PP2B inhibition. PP2B dephosphorylates many, many substrates and including ion channels and things that we, that, that could be germane to exactly the processes you're interested in. No, so I totally I, I'm wondering, I'm wondering in your mind, how do you think about LTP or LTD versus more generic consequences of these two enzymes? Yeah, so that's a very good point. So we, I think we discussed that at the first level of <laughs> already a uh, Gordon conference, I think. Uh, um, so, so yeah, I think, I think the part of the answer is in your question. Uh, why, why? So I, I, I think I cannot claim that it purely LTD and LTP or potentiation, of course not. That's why at the end, I'm more thinking about uh, PKC versus and PP2B dependent processes, because yeah, I think we have to be very um, uh, careful about that. But in the model, actually, um, because I was uh, influenced by um, a theoretical model that has been proposed about uh, the weight that plasticity at this parallel Purkinje cell uh, level can actually um, modify it at each synapse and they, therefore uh, modify uh, the type of, of predictions the cerebellum can make. Um, it's true that even 
if I, I am aware that it's certainly not only LTP, LTD potentiation, um, the model, the way the model has been proposed fits quite well with the fact that it could be actually anyway a strong influence of this plasticity, but I cannot prove it. That's why I'm, I'm cautious in, in the fact, um, in the way I, 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 uh, I explain it, because I have no, no, no direct proof that it's LTP or LTD, right? Uh, have you ever tried using the mice that we developed with Recubineer? in which um, lysine A82 of glue A2 is mutated to alanine. Uh, and this blocks LTD of the parallel fiber synapse. Okay, yeah. Uh, uh, together with Chris Dezeu uh, and others, you know, we found that it really didn't affect adaptation of vestibular ocular reflex, nor did it impair associative eyelid conditioning, you know, sort of weakening, weakening the link between that phenomenon by itself, at least, uh, mm -hmm. and those and those behaviors. So, ha have you ever thought about about using that mouse? Because you know, by going to the end of the phosphorylation, right? By going to the mm -hmm. substrate, and yep. the thing about that mouse, which is really kind of nice and subtle, is you're not even mutating the phosphorylation site. You're mutating another nearby residue. Yeah. That changes the ability to PKC to recognize that phosphorylation site. So it's not even, it's, it's, it's not just that it's more subtle in that it's one substrate, it's more subtle in that you're not preventing it from being phosphorylated, you're only preventing it from being phosphorylated by PKC. Uh, yeah, okay. So, you know, if it, it might be worthwhile to give them a try. Yeah, yeah, that could be. Actually, I remember discussing that with Chris, uh, uh maybe just before the COVID, and then we were, you know, in the middle of this anatomical pathway finding. So, but yeah, maybe you're right. I mean, if we, I want to restrict my hypothesis at some point, maybe, yeah, I need definitely to use more specific model. Yeah, to totally, yeah, definitely, yes. <laughs> Thank you. So much. I mean, you have your hands up, please go ahead. Yeah, so I, I, yeah, so I, 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 I so I guess uh, the, the reason I kind of uh, my mic was off, but I think uh, already David Linden and Shasha asked those questions because I had the same questions re related to LTP and LTD's contributions. Okay, but um, I would add on David's things that you know the recently there is another uh, mutant line photon saver from Japanese group where they can uh, block LTD just during training rather than uh, blocking LTD uh, throughout the life cycles. You could look at that paper too and see okay. if, you can, if you can impair the LTD during those uh, uh, special navigation works and see how that can affect. Yep, okay, thank you. <laughs> Sasha, you have another question? <laughs> well, I, 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 I have a, um, a deep request, okay, because I, I actually had forgotten about David Linden's mouse, which caused him to leave the cerebellar field because he'd been working for decades on the mechanism of LTD. And then the mechanism of LTD didn't actually affect boring things like the VOR and the eye blink conditioning. But I always thought it should do something, right? And so since he's still alive, just use the mice. You know, just just try them. I don't know if it's me. The sound is strange, but I think I I I heard you just say, try it, give it, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yes. because it would be so elegant, because that mechanism is the most precise mechanism that we know, single phosphorylation site, and yeah, yeah. it really does it. it changes the way glutamate receptors are trafficked. And so if you can link that with something really interesting, like the mm -hmm. hippocampal cerebellar connections, I think that would be beautiful. It's a great experiment. That's okay, all. yeah, I see that uh, now I have to go back to the lab and, <laughs> and begin then. <laughs> yeah, no, but thank you, thank you, yeah, for your feedback. I, I totally agree that uh, if, we, if, if we could go more in detail in the mechanism itself, rather than being general, to really, yeah, give uh, 
more even more strength to our hypothesis. So yeah, for sure, yes. Um, Lori, I guess I'll, I'll ask another question from you. So it, it was really surprising that the information that's flowing from the cerebellum to the hippocampus, you, you went after the vestigial and particularly caudal vestigial. Yeah. Um, what, what do you think is the, you know, we know something about the caudal vestigial, it's an oculomotor region yeah. in the primates. It's related to activity in the superior colliculus. Do you want to speculate a little bit about the role of that part of the cerebellum in navigation? Yeah. Uh, so let me say, maybe first say that it, you're right. Actually, I didn't show you all what the PhD student did, but our first guess was more to go to Dante because we, yeah. we really wanted to to prove that it could be more like, you know, cross one, Dante, or <laughs> this kind of structure. Then we found this fastigial. So, yeah, it, it maybe means, uh, so I have to, I will have to elaborate more. But on, on, a, on a first, um, let's say, thinking, it's definitely true that for navigation, you have all this cognitive uh, process that you, you need to deal with. But then, if 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 you have not, you know, if your uh, oculomotor system is not uh, properly uh, calibrated, then you can be totally lost, right? Because so I'm I'm wondering um, um, if there is more like a sensory motor processes actually that are require for the navigation process that could be uh, involved in this uh, cerebellum um, uh, hippocampus uh, pathway. That's a, a first answer. A second answer is that despite the fact that it's fastigial, it's project to this nucleus insertus. And this nucleus insertus is actually very interesting because it has been described um, as a structure that project directly to the hippocampus and directly to the medial septum coming back. <laughs> and is, it is it particularly known to influence the theta uh, in this pathway and the modulation of the theta. So it's possible also uh, that uh, this is a pathway that could modulate rhythm uh, and particular theta rhythm in both medial septum and hippocampus and could participate um, in the elaboration of some processes like uh, phase precession or this kind of thing we find in the hippocampus. So you see, <laughs> there, there is several several level of uh, of uh, influence that this pathway can actually um, provoke to the hippocampus. But we are at the at the very beginning. This year. yeah. So let's, let's see what we find. Yeah, let's see. If, All right. I'm, I'm um, just, I'm going to, I'm going to say one more thing. Yeah, sorry. Um, but uh, this, because uh, um, I guess as the, the uh, holder of, of knowledge of, of tiny little details that accumulate, the link, I think, perhaps, between what Lord just said um, and uh, uh, the theta generation in hippocampus and Reza's question about saccadic eye movements is that the cods and theta are actually inextricably linked. Mm -hmm. So yeah. theta is about processing information to do stuff with. And so there's a, um, the field doesn't understand as much as it will, I suppose, um, soon, but those things are linked. Okay. And thank you, thank you both. Thank you, Reza, for hosting this and Laura for your beautiful yeah, yeah. talk. Thank you for the discussion, actually. Give me more idea. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> are, there, are there any other questions for Laura? Laura, thank you so much for spending your time with us. And, yeah, and you're all, very all welcome. It's a pleasure to discuss. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Have a wonderful day, everyone. Okay. <laughs>